Good evening, everyone, and uh, good morning to Dr. Gerard in the U.S. in New Jersey. I would like to uh, take this opportunity to welcome all of you, especially our distinguished speaker tonight, Dr. Gerard Malanga. Uh, this is a very uh, rare opportunity to have him in this uh, forum in our mask ultrasound Zoom meeting, and uh, I take pleasure in uh, welcoming you and welcoming him in our uh, meeting tonight. So our speaker tonight is, uh, or this morning in the U.S., is uh, one of the forerunners of regenerative medicine. And he's also a PM&R and a pain and sports medicine, all uh, wrapped into one. So we can see that uh, he's been active doing so many research on regenerative medicine. In fact, he's the chairman of the AAPMR Task Force on Regenerative Medicine. And so uh, having him tonight to be our speaker is a very rare privilege. And uh, I really would, would like to thank Dr. Jerry for uh, taking this uh, very special time with us to share with us uh, his experience and of course, his research on the adipose as a treatment for orthopedic conditions. But before we proceed, let's just pause for a moment for a short prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful evening. We thank you, O oh God, for preserving our lives, giving us good health, giving us good strength. And we thank you, O oh God, for this opportunity to listen and learn from Dr. Jerry as he talks about orthopedic conditions and how it's being treated by adipose tissue. We thank you, O oh God, for this beautiful day. And we ask Lord for your forgiveness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Dr. Gerard... Welcome to our Mask Ultrasound Zoom. So it's all yours now. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I'm so excited to be speaking to all of you. Uh, Jim and I have been talking about me coming to speak <clears throat> and visit the Philippines and one day I'm going to make it, uh, and I'm going to be so excited to be there in person. But thank you. Um, sure, yeah, it, it's going to be really great. I'm going to get on that plane, and I'm going to be okay. You know, making the travel and seeing your beautiful country and, and your beautiful people. Um, I mean, I've had the pleasure of knowing and, and meeting Jim and others um, uh, at our PM and R meetings, and it's always been so great. You've always been so gracious to me, um, and it's a real honor to be speaking to to all of you. And again, I hope to be there in person one day. And it's always wonderful for me to share what I've learned and what I experienced. I've been so blessed in so many ways. So um, today, I want to talk about a little bit of the controversy in the use of adipose tissue uh, because it is a little controversial and um, and just why would we use it? How is it used? And then this whole issue of compliance. And then I want to leave it open to lots of questions uh, at the end regarding um, what we found in our, our research. So these are my uh, different uh, disclosures. Um, you know, I have a few textbooks that I'm very proud of. And I know many of you have, um, have purchased them and used them and found them to be helpful. And that's very gratifying um, on the advisory board of a few different companies. None of that should interfere with what I'm doing here. One thing that I'm very proud of that we've started is a database registry, where now we've opened up the capability of collecting data really easy, easily and very inexpensively in this area of regenerative treatments. And data is really the most important thing in this area. Um, always want to uh, remember uh, Victor Ibrahim, uh, who passed away at a very young age a, a couple of years ago, who was my co-editor in our regenerative treatment book. Uh, uh, just a wonderful uh, person, spirit, and a great mind and leader in this area. So let's just talk about the issue and why are we even doing any of these regenerative treatments? Well, one of the biggest, there are a lot of orthopedic problems and, and they consume a lot of uh, healthcare expenditures and um, cause a lot of pain and disability. But osteoarthritis is one of the most prominent ones. And, you know, it's a common problem now and continues to grow at a very fast rate. So uh, it's defined as a progressive degenerative articular cartilage inflammation, subchondral bone remodeling, and soft tissue damage. So that's a very important concept of the damage, the inflammation, the remodeling, and soft tissues. 
because many people want to regrow all the cartilage, but it's all these other areas that cause the pain and disability in osteoarthritis. And we have various conservative treatment methods that range from medications and, and really good physical therapy and strengthening and common sense things like a good diet and watching weight and things like that. Um, and there are prior injection things such as cortisone, which has now lost favor because of its negative effects, and then the lubricating shots that can be helpful. But unfortunately, uh, many patients do not respond or respond partially or respond only for a short period of time, and then there's nothing left. Um, about 20% of these patients are placed on opiate medications, which is not desirable, and we know the ramifications of that. And then they're essentially pushed into getting a total knee arthroplasty. Most patients actually don't want to have a knee arthroplasty. They sit in what's referred to as this osteoarthritis treatment gap. They can sit in that gap for 10, 15, even 20 years. That's the gap when we've exhausted non-operative treatment and they're felt to be a candidate. Many patients don't want to have the surgery. And unfortunately, total knee arthroplasty is not as successful as hip replacement. About 30% of patients still have knee pain after a knee replacement. So, um, you know, osteoarthritis, um, you know, as far as what occurs in it, uh, there aren't increase in uh, white cells. It's more of a, a breakdown of tissue. It's more of a uh, loss of these uh, regulation of these very important chemokines and cytokines with a progression occurring because of these catabolic factors and these dominant pro-inflammatory cytokines such as TN and alpha, uh, IL-1, IL-6 that push uh, and, and break down the articular cartilage. And that's what we need to work on the most. And so why consider the stem cell therapy procedures? I use the word stem cell very carefully because that term is very much misused and it requires discrete um, characterization of the cells. We know in various areas of our bodies that there are these cells that can induce tissue healing. And we know there are multiple musculoskeletal conditions ranging from long bone fractures to avascular necrosis to meniscal tears to rotator cuff injuries and even disc pathologies that, you know, we just don't have great answers for and the surgical solutions are not that great. So what is the mechanism of action? I think Arnold Kaplan has described this the best. He feels that there are these cells, these pericytes that sit on perivascular tissue uh, on vessels that once there's a traumatic event or a breakdown of tissue, that these uh, cells then travel to the area of damage. Um, they morph into or develop into something that we call a mesenchymal stem cell, but more prop properly is referred to as a medicinal signaling cell. Those cells signal to the local tissue and have anti-apatotic -ap uh, 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 capabilities, anti-catabolic, anti-fibrotic, they're pro-chondrogenic, they're pro-angiogenic, and they modulate inflammation. So they essentially nourish various tissues, and for the knee joint, they nourish the articular cartilage to becoming more native and more active. So in the past, the mantra in terms of cell procedures was that bone marrow was preferred over adipose. And that was because bone marrow is felt to be a better precursor toward articular cartilage and to bone and other orthopedic conditions. But over time, that's changed. Um, and one of the things that the adipose group has always pointed out are the number of MSCs or stem cells per cc of tissue volume. And so if you look at this uh, study that was published in 2007, you can see the, the big differences per cell um, for MSCs. So there's recent evidence, though, that um, adipose tissue can work as well as bone marrow. And in fact, there's more evidence that shows adipose tissue might be the preferred tissue to use for various orthopedic conditions. They seem to be more resistant to the harsh environment in a inflamed joint or in a broken down tendon. Um, and there are other things that perhaps make it more favorable. In the United States, the thing that makes it more favorable is that the United States population has 40% of us as being overweight. And so there's ample tissue available to harvest and then to cleanse and to use. Um, it does require some level of processing and therefore 
The FDA now is very has written, uh, written issue guidance regarding this, dating back to 2016, in fact, that says that if you're going to use adipose tissue, that you are restricted to no more than minimal manipulation. And we'll talk about what that means a little bit. This is just some nice schema that talk about the adipose tissue in its raw form in the various cells. It can be broken down enzymatically and produce something called stromovascular fraction. Unfortunately, the FDA feels that once you've done that, you've altered the characteris characteristics, the characteristics of the uh, adipose tissue, and now in their mind, you've uh, created a quote unquote drug. And thus that's felt to be more than minimal manipulation and not compliant with their guidance. But within SVF are some adipose tissue, there are the parasites, there are the epithelial cells. All those cells work to look and find the native tissue, release various important chemical factors that are very helpful for healing of tissue. Now, our prior understanding of these quote unquote stem cells was that they would float to the area of damage, they would turn into that tissue and become new cartilage or new tendon or other new tissues. Now we know that that's a very uh, immature way of understanding what happens with stem cell therapies. Um, this is a, a really super interesting study that I use when people try to figure out what is more preferred, bone marrow or adipose tissue. I will tell you that you could use either tissue depending on the patient population. But this looked at um, some samples, five uh, patients who are going to undergo hip replacement. And they harvested their bone marrow and they harvested their adipose tissue. So from the same patient, and then they exposed the cartilage that was on that uh, hip explant to see what would happen to the cartilage cells. And in fact, it was the uh, adipocyte, uh, the adipose stem cells that were the preferred source. They seemed to have a younger phenotype they demonstrated more enhanced proliferation and differentiation capacity in the same donor study. This is another uh, profile looking at, again at same donor uh, patients. One uh, adipose uh, bone marrow uh, obtained from the same patients to see what would happen and to look at the chemical uh, composition of what would happen. Uh, so these are the, the three donors and what would happen as they looked as they exposed various type of chondrocytes to that. And again, the conclusions were that the uh, adipose derived stem cells were more controllable and more adaptable to surviving in this hypoxic cartilage and may be the preferred source for patients that have osteoarthritis in the treatment. So um, we have used uh, to be compliant since 2015, microfragmented adipose tissue. So that's tissue that you harvest the adipose tissue, you cleanse it, you wash it, and then you can microfragment it through this device. We've used a company called Lipogens. There are now a couple other devices that are uh, able to do this and that have some FDA clearance. But the question has been, is that as good as or equal to or maybe superior to the enzymatic SVF? So this was a study by Filardo from Italy. Giuseppe Filardo has written a lot in this whole area of regenerative treatments and basically looked at two groups. Uh, one group were the control group. One group got the microfragmented adipose tissue. One group got the SVF and basically concluded that they did not elicit the uh, significant systemic adverse effects. So there was no negative effects from either microfragmented adipose tissue, stromovascular tissue, or even expanded adipose derived stem cells that are grown in a dish. But what they felt was most imp uh, impressive was the microfragmented showed the most promising data in terms of the protection of the articular cartilage surface from the joint degenerative arthritis process. And so when we look at the biochemistry of adipose derived stem cells, and we look at the various sources, then, and we look at the various cell markers, right? These are what define what is a true stem cell. So if you're going to say, I do stem cell therapies, unfortunately, you need to do all of this work to truly say you're delivering stem cells. Otherwise, we use the term cellular procedure. And these are the markers that would call something a pericyte, a stromal cell, a stromal cell that without these markers. And what do they do? 
They decrease pain through uh, modulation of substance P. They increase vascularity through VEGF and uh, HGF. They're anti-inflammatory, immunosuppressive. They interact with microf macrophages to make them more positive toward healing. And they downrate down-regulate pro-inflammatory factors that we talked about before that are very damaging to the articular cartilage. So this is a nice paper um, that basically reviews the different strategies and basically reviews the pros and the cons of using something that's enzyme-based, that SVF, versus a non-SVF type of product, right? And so basically what you look, what you find in an SVF product as a as a true pro is that you can get higher yield of cells and those cells are very pure, but those are non manipulative, uh, non, they're more than minimal manipulation. There's, uh, they're expensive, time consuming, and you need to have an enzyme that you use. You have to make sure that enzyme is uh, appropriately uh, processed. Uh, in terms of a non enzyme, it's minimal manipulation, very cost effective, can occur at the bedside really rapidly. Uh, but you have a lower yield and there's some mechanical stressors and things like that. And these are the different methods that you can use uh, to get a microfragmented adipose tissue at this time. Some have FDA approvals, some do not. So how about clinical efficacy? Well, you know, in the basic science dish, we know that we can make adipose tissue uh, turn into the various precursors such as bone, cartilage, uh, tendon and adipose, obviously. And then we know there are various animal models that have demonstrated um, proliferation of the cells within the rat model knee joint, demonstrating increased cartilage thickness and improved tissue preservation. It's been looked at in rabbits, demonstrating uh, lower degrees of cartilage degeneration uh, with decreasing the severity of cartilage osteoarthritis. It's been used in dogs, it's been used in horses. So there are a lot of models that have demonstrated efficacy in animal models. But what about human models? Um, well, we now have a rising evidence and we've written a couple of review articles demonstrating the, uh, the effectiveness for microfragmented adipose tissue in the treatment of knee arthritis. So we have one that was published uh, a couple of years ago and this article uh, with Jack Halbert, uh, one of the residents or actually medical students at uh, Rutgers who helped publish this in the Biologic Orthopedic Journal, reviewing the supportive literature for uh, microfragmented adipose tissue. In terms of stromovascular fraction uh, studies, uh, this study by McKellick, where he looked at several thousand people and they demonstrated at least 75% improvement in 63% and 50% improvement in 91 uh, patients that had significant hip and uh, knee arthritis, mostly a knee. A uh, co et al. looked at improvement in biomarkers and uh, MRI, improvement in knee scores. Who et et al. demonstrated reduction in cartilage defects with, uh, on biopsies, hyaline-like cartilage, with articular cartilage, which is very different from some of the orthopedic me uh, methods, such as microfracture, which is not hyaline-like cartilage. And most recently, this Eve Marie Perez published this intraarticular ASC as a safe alternative for severe knee arthritis that was just published last year. Perhaps one of the most impressive recent studies was the study by Garza et al. by a company called GID Group. Now this is an FDA compliant um, study where they looked at various doses. So this is very important uh, when we look at regenerative treatments to try to figure out what is the proper dose? And it's very hard when you look at raw fat or microfragmented, but when you look at SVF, then you can look at the amount of cells. Um, and they looked at a high dose, low dose and placebo group in 39 patients with remarkable improvements, even in the lower dose group. So you didn't need the super high group, but the high dose group demonstrated more efficacy with a greater percentage of change at 12 months. Um, and both groups did that uh, compared to the placebo group, but their improvements were really impressive. I mean, they had improvements of 89.5% at their one-year mark and 68.2% uh, versus zero in the placebo group. So this is now in a phase three study, uh, placebo controlled with the normal saline. We are uh, happy to be one of the five uh, groups that will be studying this. And we've treated the first five um, in this study. 
Uh, this should be completed by the end of this year, and uh, we'll see what, what it shows. But hopefully, it will allow for a bedside FDA-compliant method of using SVF when needed uh, in the treatment of knee arthritis. So here's the big problem that we kind of mentioned is that, you know, this is not approved. SVF from enzymatic digestion is not approved according to the FDA guidance, and we need to be aware of that. And so there are human tissue product regulations, HCTPs, that must meet, if you're going to use them in clinical practice, uh, must meet the four criteria of being minimally manipulated, intended for homologous use. And this is a tricky term. Homologous use means that the tissue needs to be used for the same purpose as it did when you first harvested. it. For adipose tissue, it's felt to be a supportive tissue, a tissue filler. Um, and when we talk about using it in various conditions, such as a rotator cuff tear or knee arthritis, we use it to fill in the soft tissue defects that are that are there. We don't use it and we don't say it has a systemic effect. We don't say it's going to regenerate cartilage uh, or tendons. It shouldn't be combined with anything else, um, and it shouldn't be used for any sort of systemic effects. So minimal manipulation, again, does not alter the original relevant characteristics. It has to be similar to as it was when it was present in the donor situ uh, uh, situation. Relevant meaning that it could have a meaningful benefit on how uh, or change in how the tissue performs when used for reconstruction, repair, or replacement. And what they do allow for is for cutting, grinding, shaping. It can be soaked in an antibiotic. A lot of these rules were used for things like being, uh, harvesting veins for bypass surgery, other plastic surgical procedures. So enzymatic uh, digestion means you use a collagenase or a trypsan that are commonly used. You, often this will be with centrifugation to get rid of all these tissues that you may not feel necessary. Adipocytes, red cells, and other contamination within uh, the original adipose source. There are two options. There's stromovascular tissue containing a variety of cells uh, with adipocytes, fibroblasts, and then the MSCs and white cells. It can, the adipocyte, the adipose-derived stem cells can be isolated from SVF after plating them and then culturing them. But again, that's definitely more than minimal manipulation. Fra microfragmented adipose tissue uh, can be obtained using this one device uh, produced by a company called Lipogens. And I have done some consulting with that company and speaking for them. But now there are other devices that can be used. This allows for cleansing, gently resizing the adipose tissue, it uses a closed, low pressure liquid environment where the adipose tissue is mechanically microfragmented. The final product contains a variety of cell types and perhaps that's as important as isolating the cell types. And there is some um, evidence to say that there's a great concentration of pericytes and allows uh, for you to obtain those pericytes in a more efficient manner. Um, now, this was felt to be fine until there was a meeting just last uh, December and at the AAOM meeting, they invited Dr. Peter Marks, who's the director and center for the Center of Biologic Evaluations. Uh, so he's one of the FDA directors. And he was asked specifically whether lipogen or microfragmented adipose tissue was compliant. And at first he said no, actually he said no probably four or five times and shook his head. And then came on the next day and sort of pulled back and said, no, it's an FDA compliant device and the clinicians need to use their best judgment when to use these devices. And you could always go to the FDA to ask them about that. In terms of uh, human studies, there are multiple human studies that have been published, including these studies by Russo. We studied, uh, we published a study with Jay Packel and uh, Dr. Steinkoff, an orthopedic surgeon on very elderly with severe grade three and four arthritis that show benefits lasting out to about a year. There are now 80 peer reviewed publications with up to three uh, year follow-up. And the good news is 95% of those ha uh, have not been sponsored by the company. Um, there's been a debate over when to use bone marrow or is bone marrow better or uh, adipose tissue better. 
This uh, was a study, a uh, retrospective study uh, by my good friend, Ken Mountner, who you all know, who looked at his data and compared pre and post uh, knee arthritis patients that had bone marrow versus MFAT. And you can see that there were no statistically significant differences. The lines are virtually identical. A significant improvement in all coups and pain scores in these patients. So the conclusions were there were no differences. Uh, whether you use bone marrow or adipose tissue in that patient population. So uh, conclusions. We know that knee osteoarthritis is very common. The management is very difficult and uh, can be limited. And joint replacement surgery, um, we need to try to, um, try to hold off as long as possible, use it in the right patient population and try to find alternatives. We now know that there are basic science animal studies and clinical studies that support the use of adipose tissues uh, with a well-documented immunomodulatory effect that are clinically effective in reducing pain um, and perhaps um, preventing this progression to late-stage knee osteoarthritis. Uh, the clinical use of adipose, you must be compliant with the FDA and there are compliant devices. And we need more research uh, to compare outcomes look at the various dosing, look at the comparisons to SVF, um, and looking at uh, different methods that can be tailored to the specific type of patient populations. Okay, so. Oh, thank you, Dr. Jerry. Uh, yeah. Can we have some question and answer? Yeah, please. Okay, uh, let me throw the first uh, question. You've mentioned about uh, the SBF being a non-compliant for the FDA by the FDA yeah. for for use, and uh, you have mentioned about the MFAT and of course the lipogems. Uh, is this is this any different from the micronization process? Some some are doing micronization where they use a filter in order yeah. to uh, micronize the the fat. Yeah. Uh, is this similar with, is this almost like uh, doing an MFAT as well or uh, the yeah. results would be uh -huh. different? Yeah, there are a couple of companies that promote sort of doing syringes going back and forth. Um, uh, what I would tell you is that those haven't been fully validated and in independent sort of uh, studies, the viability, you, you traumatize the cells a great deal when you do that. And so... Um, when we harvest adipose tissue, you need to use good techniques. You can't harvest it the way the, um, the plastic surgeons do it very violently. You need to ver use very low uh, percentage dose of lidocaine. Um, and so what the lipogen and a couple other devices have been able to do is to uh, maintain the viability of the cells that are there and extract really healthy, nice looking cells. Some of the other products, I don't think will achieve that. So if you have, so uh, what you try to get to is 80 to 90% viability of your cells. If you have a device where you go back and forth and your viability is let's say 60, 70%, but maybe there's enough cells, you may be able to get by with that, but I would say that it should be uh, more properly studied. So I think you're using a less robust method of trying to get the tissue. Yeah. What about if you combine the bone marrow and adipose tissue at the same time? Would it okay. make a lot of difference? No one knows is the, is the true answer to that. Um, <laughs> you couldn't combine it in a syringe because the FDA would say that's a device, but you could inject one and then inject the other. Um, I see. So here are some thoughts. I think there may be certain patients that combining them might make some sense, but you have to figure that out because number one, it's adding another procedure that's an invasive procedure and it's an added cost and these things are not covered by insurance. So now you can double the cost and if you don't have good data to support it, then I think you're just adding cost in a procedure without really being scientific at all about it. Um, you know, bone marrow, while it doesn't have a lot of cells, especially stem cells, it has a lot of other things, uh, including IRAP, interleukin receptor antagonist protein. And it may be that it's the IRAP component that is the most important component in bone marrow that helps with tissue healing and pain and, and things like that. 
-hmm. Recent studies actually, though, have shown that there's a fair amount of IRAP in adipose tissue, in, you know, microfragmented and other methods of adipose tissue. So I think we need to be thoughtful about these. I just read a study that just came out on combining MFAT with PRP, with various doses of PRP. And it's got a great thought. And plastic surgeons do that because the adipose tissue and even bone marrow tissue loves um, the platelets and the growth factors to differentiate and to uh, in increase. But, you know, that study showed no difference whether they did it with the PRP or without. And so I think we get these ideas and these thoughts and we we have something that's good and we keep trying to make it better. And certainly that's great, but I think you really need to do studies. And that's why another reason why we started this database company is that shoot, if you guys in uh, the Philippines are mixing uh, bone marrow and adipose and your results are incredible, that's what we should be doing. I think we should tailor it to different types of population. So not everyone should get everything. There's a big push now for, uh, doing uh, uh, intra, uh, intraosseous bone marrow for knee osteoarthritis. Again, sounds great, much more invasive, very little literature to support it. I mean, there, there's literature by Hernagou in France for some patients, but still no study head-to-head -head that would show that that needs to happen. Thank you, Dr. Jerry. So yeah. I think uh, Dr. Domingo here has a question. Joe. Thank you very much, Dr. Jerry, for a very comprehensive lecture. It was hey, a whirlwind you. of a lecture, definitely, but very, very enjoyable. Thank you. Uh, yeah. May I ask Dr. Jerry, if uh, what do you think about using, uh, I know it's not approved in the United States, but I think Dr. Dr. Ken Mountner might be doing a study on the use of uh, cord blood. Um, for uh, for for the same purpose, uh, what do you think of of of, uh, of, uh, of using cord blood, Doctor J? Yeah, so uh, there, you know, there are a lot of products that are way advertised and hyped before the science. So we've gone way ahead, and people start using things. So the amniotic fluid, um, lots of promotion, lots of thought not a lot of literature, hardly anything. Um, the amniotic, the Wharton's jelly, uh, what we will call birth tissue products, uh, lots of quote unquote potential with lots of perhaps old basic science that shows there are a lot of cells in there uh, that could potentiate healing. Um, virtually no literature. Um, um, so, um, what, what has been found is that within the vials that are currently being sold, if you look at viable stem cells, there are zero. So there's been independent studies by Lisa Fortier, um, a veterinarian uh, from Cornell, and uh, Centeno and some of his lab people that have tried to find whether there were true stem cells in those vials, and there weren't true stem cells in those vials. Um, on top of that, a couple of years ago, there were about 19 patients who developed systemic um, sepsis from contaminated vials with E. coli, mm -hmm. uh, very scary. So again, um, I think there may be a place for these various products. There, there may be a place for amniotic. There may be a place for umbilical cells that are properly obtained and stored. Uh, there may be a place for Wharton jelly the other uh, product that has gotten an irrational exuberance, using the term by Ben Bernanke when he looked at the economy, is that of exosomes, right? Mm -hmm. Exosomes, which are extracellular vesicles that are released, that are taken and pooled from a donor um, without really, with meager, meager evidence clinically, with sci scientific evidence that it might be effective but you have to remember that exosomes are how viruses work. And um, we know that we don't know a lot of when you're taking somebody else's cells or cell products and then putting it into another person. We know if we take your own things that your body will recognize it and will appreciate it. And there won't be a big concern if you use good sterile technique. 
Okay. So I think right. the hype has gotten way ahead of the science. I think there could be a place. Everyone needs to try to find the right study to do, study it, collect the data, and publish it. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank Do you, Dr. Jerry. Yeah, Do Do Dr. Jerry, uh, let me also uh, ask if, uh, for the purpose of this uh, forum here, um, the administration of these products, uh, is it always ultrasound guided or fluoroscopic guided, or can you do a blind injection for this procedure? Don't, don't do them blind. There's no place for a blind injection. Um, you know, whether you have to be directly on the spot of pathology, that might be somewhat questionable, but you definitely need to make sure you're in the general structure of what you want to be. So let's start with a, just a global thing, like a knee joint. Everyone thinks they can get into a knee joint. And many of us by palpation without ultrasound guidance. And I would say most of us could get into a knee joint, assuming that that knee joint has pretty normal anatomy, that the person's not very obese, that there's not a big puffy knee, um, things like that. But even in the best hands, the miss rate, which was studied by an orthopedic surgeon by uh, Doug Jackson uh, many years ago, found the miss rate was 30%. So you don't want to leave that to chance. And that's looking at a big area of a knee joint. Now, if you want to try to get it into a meniscal tear, a specific area of a rotator cuff tear, obviously you need to identify that tear and then you need to guide your uh, product into that tear. When we use these, when we've studied it in rotator cuff tears, we're trying to use it as a tissue filler. So we're trying to direct it um, into that because it acts as a scaffold to fill in the defect of the, where the tear is and then allow for release of, of substances. If you're just trying, the, the cells are quite smart and, and home to areas of tissue damage. And so if you just need to treat a global thing, you can get away with getting pretty close by and then have the cells kind of migrate and release and interact with the cells. Uh, but for most things, you're going to be very precise. Ultrasound does the job for most. If you're going to start doing some spine things, then probably you need fluoroscopy for many spine procedures. Thank you, Dr. Jerry. Uh, there's another question from Pash. Pash, go ahead. Dr. Jerry, thank you so much for this lecture. Uh, I incidentally have your book, thanks to Dr. Jim. Unfortunately, it's in the clinic. I couldn't show you personally. But anyway, you know, I'd like to ask regarding the effect of lidocaine when using this uh, alongside your BMAC. Would it be uh, of any concern? Because I know for PRP, there's a little bit of uh, concern about using lidocaine. Yes. So we're very cautious um, about not having lidocaine into the target tissue as much as possible. Um, so we will do a nice skin wheel. We will uh, use lidocaine all the way down to the subcutaneous tissue, but we will avoid lidocaine at the target tissue as much as possible. We also use pretty dilute lidocaine. We use uh, 0.05% uh, lidocaine. So 1% that's diluted in half. Thank you, doctor. You're welcome. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Jerry. Any more questions? Dr. Jerry, I'll show you. This is your book. Can you see it? I can see it, yeah. And this is another of your book. <laughs> well, I, I know, yeah. Jim, whenever we go to a meeting, I mean, you're, su you're supporting my uh, kids' college tuition. I thank you for that. House and this, another, and this is another book, Dr. Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> you have all your books. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've been very blessed to have many people to work with me. Those books are not mine. Those are me uh, working with others to create something. You know, just like all of you know, working together, we can achieve a lot. And um, yeah. yeah. And so one day I hope to come to the Philippines and sign yes. everyone's books. Right? Yes. See, we, we, see your we're local yeah. country, um, and just interact more personally. I, we, we will get there. We'll get through this. 
uh, yeah. time and uh, we'll be better and uh, we'll appreciate being together even more, right? So, yeah, yeah. And uh, you know what, Dr. Jerry, a lot of us here are interested to join the IOF. So uh, let us know how to, how to join that group, the Interventional Orthopedic Foundation where you were a former president. So we're, we're uh -huh. glad that uh, you have organized that uh, organization. Yeah, for... it's a great organization. It's dedicated to education, standards, and guidelines. Um, if you, uh, Jillian Abramson, she's the executive director. So if you shoot me an email, I can give you her email and everyone can contact her. Um, yeah, I'd encourage you. We're going to have a meeting in Colorado in February, um, in person. So that's our plan. So that's um, good. Yeah. Great. Uh, is Dr. Rahul still the president now? Dr. Rahul? Design. Dr. Rahul uh, finished his uh, presidency, and now it's Dr. Don Buford, a really great, thoughtful orthopedic surgeon who really wants to be collaborative, which is a very rare phenomenon in this area. I will tell you that there is a group of orthopedic surgeons that formed an organization called the Biologic Association, and they greatly want to interact with non-surgical, uh, non-operative people. And I'm uh, happy to be part of that. Ken Mountner is part of that. This uh, uh, gentleman, Shane Shapiro from uh, Mayo Clinic is part of that. And so that organization, I think, will also be a nice collaborative effort in this area. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Uh, doc Dr. Dunn Bufford will be speaking to us by first week of June. So also oh. watch out for that. Yeah, I invited right. him to speak. Yeah. Oh, Fent, yeah, he's just a, he's a really thoughtful, really good person. He's done some really good work in this area. So, yeah, good. Yeah. Thank you, Do Dr. Gerard, for this uh, very great uh, lecture and uh, for allowing yourself to join us in this meeting. So, yeah, we, we I apologize for all the technical difficulties, but I'm glad we got through it somehow. And um, it's so great to see all your faces and, um, yeah, thank you for inviting me, and let's do it again soon. Yes, thank you very much. And okay. uh, be safe always, Dr. Jerry. Yeah, yeah God, God bless. bless. Well. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Thank okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.